Hi there, I'm Champion Chair Kevin Davey, and in this video, I'm going to talk about position sizing and money management. So let's get started. What I hope to teach today is first, I want to give you my philosophy on money management and position sizing because it might be a little unique compared to a lot of people out there. Then I'm just going to talk about five simple position sizing methods and compare them. And then we'll talk about is there a best method and can you get reward without risk? And finally, we'll talk about what position sizing can do and what it cannot do. Okay, so with that, let's get started. My philosophy, how important is money management and position sizing? Here's how I kind of look at things. If you had terrible money management and terrible position sizing, if you just did the worst things possible at the worst possible times and you had a losing strategy on top of it, something that didn't make money, in the long run you'd lose, right? That's like your typical Vegas gambler. He just comes in, doesn't know what he or she is doing, and just gambles money maybe you know has some fun and gets entertained but it's gonna walk away a loser in the long run that's how most people approach trading honestly so that's one option another option is you still have the terrible money management position sizing you just do everything wrong but you have a winning strategy and this would be sort of like a card counter in blackjack now card counting, for those of you who don't know, gives you a demonstrated edge in blackjack. Now the casinos don't like it, and if they find you, they'll kick you out, but it gives you an edge. But if you didn't bet correctly with it, and you were just randomly betting big bets, little bets, you'd lose. So the money management, the position sizing would destroy the edge that you had by card counting. So that's a pretty common thing too for people. Well, let's look at the flip side. What if you had really great money management and position sizing? That's not going to help you if you still have a losing strategy. Okay? You'll just lose all your money. You might lose it more slowly if you're only betting a certain percentage and you're real good about that. That would be like playing roulette, which in the long run you're going to lose but just being good about how you bet. You can maximize the time that you spend, but in the long run, you're still going to lose. The only way to really win at trading is to have superb money management and position sizing and a demonstrated winning strategy. That would be a card counter in Vegas, playing blackjack, and doing it perfectly with his money management. That person in the long run will win. So the bottom line with all this is even though this video is going to be about money management and position sizing, your focus should really be about the strategy first. If you don't have the good strategy, all that I'm going to talk about from here on out doesn't matter. So Make sure you have some good strategies before you try to apply these techniques. Make sense? Hopefully. And then talking about position sizing, you know, there's tons of different ways to do it. There's literally millions of ways. And a, a trap a lot of people get into is they'll take their strategy results and they'll run 5, 10, 20 different position sizing methods and they'll find the best one. You know, there's uh, one way that I won't talk about today, but it's called Optimal F. It will actually maximize your returns, but that's for a given strategy. And if the strategy changes parameters or performance even a little bit, now you're not at the optimum anymore. And that could cause big trouble. What it comes down to is there really is no right way, there is no wrong way to position size. It depends on your goals. So, for example, if I was doing a trading contest, I would position size differently than if I was trying to save for my kids' college funds. D 
different goals will lead you to different position sizing methods. And remember, when you do it wrong, position sizing can blow out an account really quick. Even with a great strategy, you can still lose. And the flip side is, as I said before, just because you have good money management, it's not going to save you if your strategy is bad. So you need both to succeed. So let's talk about some examples. And I'll show you just on some sample systems, and we'll kind of see what kind of happens. We're going to do five different position sizing methods. We're going to look at fixed size. We're going to look at trading one contract per a certain number of dollars. We're going to look at percent risk. We're going to look at a Kelly criterion, which is pretty popular. And then we'll look at a simple martingale. And out of all those, probably trading one contract per X number of dollars in your account is the most popular. It's the most simple. It's easy to understand. You know, when you double your account, you'd add a contract, that kind of thing. So a lot of people do that. But all the five of these are th they're something we're going to look at and compare. So the first one, fixed size, hey, you just always trade one contract. So you can see in this chart that blue line. No matter what your equity is, you're always trading one contract. And that's a good baseline for comparing any kind of position sizing method you do. Just compare it to trading one contract. Here your number of contracts goes up as your account size goes up. So at $15,000, at $30,000, at $40,000, $45,000 here, you're adding a contract. So it's kind of like a stair step. And of course, if your equity went down, then you'd ramp down. Percent risk kind of looks similar. Uh, it's based on your either your average loss or maybe your largest loss and also includes a percent risk that you set. So depending how you set this, you can be very aggressive or you can be pretty conservative. You know, a good rule of thumb that some people use is they say, well, I'm going to risk 2% on every trade. And you can do that and you can see how quickly or not your equity increases. The fourth method uses the Kelly criterion. There's the, the equation for it. It uses your win percentage, loss percentage, and your average loss to figure out the number of contracts to trade. And it kind of scales up with winning percentage. Now, obviously the problem with that is, what if your back test winning percentage turns out to be different than your real time winning percentage? Yeah, then Kelly criteria going to kind of be off a little bit, but you can at least see how it works here. And then the last one, Martingale. Uh, this is a great method if you have unlimited money because you'll never lose. Eventually, you'll have a winning trade and you'll get your money back. But for most of us, we don't have unlimited money. <laughs> so the Martingale is eventually probably going to wipe us out. But in this case, what I'm doing is if I lose my first trade, I'm going to double the size. Then I'll trade two contracts. If I lose again, I'll double to four and then double to eight. And then I'll stay at eight until I have a winning trade. So it's sort of a modified martingale because I didn't want to get to a huge size. But you kind of get the idea with it. I don't particularly recommend this unless you're just going for broke. You know, it's the old Vegas type gambling thing of let it ride you know you keep going see how quickly you can build up and sometimes you really can build up pretty quickly all right and uh you know the let it ride is just for the losing trades by the way if you were winning you'd pull everything off just to make that clear okay so the ground rules i'm just going to apply these strategies to two sample strategies i have one's for the gold one's for the euro and I'm going to go up to 100 contracts maximum. You know, that's ridiculous for a lot of people, but at least it'll show you the potential. And if I hit a 90% drawdown <clears throat> from the equity peak, which is huge, right? <clears throat> that 
I'm going to stop trading. That's kind of crazy, but I just wanted to set some, some general ground rules so you could see things. So here's the strategies. The light blue is the gold strategy. The dark blue is the euro strategy. And the combination of them is that pink one. And over long periods of time, both those strategies make money. They have ups and downs. They have drawdowns. So they're a good system to apply position sizing to. And here's the results for the gold strategy. If we started with $25,000 in equity. And you can't even see the single contract. It's, it's underneath the yellow curve. But you can see, depending on which method you pick, you're going to get wildly different results. And in this case, the martingale just blows away everything. If you can live with that drawdown towards the end, uh, you end up with a lot of money where you don't with those other ones. Okay. And if you start with $50,000, you get about the same results where, again, the martingale is the best one. And a couple of them just kind of slowly increase. But this should tell you at least one thing, that the, the starting equity definitely matters into which one is good and which one is bad and which one, not in this case, which one is the best. But in general, that's kind of what happens. It depends on your starting equity. That's what makes position sizing so tough. Here's the euro strategy with 25K. Now, in this case, you can see the martingale actually blew out. So you actually hit a drawdown so big that it just flatlined. It couldn't take any more trades. Same with the Kelly criterion. It went flat eventually because it had a 90% drawdown. So in this case, just adding one contract every 25,000 seemed to work the best. Okay. But if you go to $50,000 start equity, you still get the one contract every $50,000 is the best. And you still get the Martingale and the Kelly to blow out. So again, depending on your starting equity, you might get some different results. And certainly compared to the gold strategy, these are completely different results, right? What's best for one strategy isn't best for the other. And that's going to make any kind of universal position sizing pretty difficult. But what we can draw some conclusions just from seeing these sample strategies. You know, it's easy to show enormous growth. And that's what you got to watch out for is a lot of people will, will show you some strategy results and they'll say, well, look, here you do this with some kind of position sizing and look, you could have had $1.4 million. Well, yeah, but... You apply that to a different strategy and you blow the strategy out. So is that a good idea? I don't know. And sometimes, depending on the method and the parameters you use, let's just take percent risk, for example. If you use a small value, it might prevent you from trading at all. Where it says, hey, you're risking too much, so don't trade. So you got to watch out for that. So the point is, there's never a one-size-fits-all solution, okay? Different start equities will give you a be different best case. Different strategies will give you a different best case. So it's really hard to generalize, oh, Kelly criteria is what you should be using. Sometimes, yeah, that's great. Other times, eh, maybe not. So watch out for that. So you might be saying, well, if it's different for all different ones, is it even possible? How hard is this to position size? Well, back in April of 2021, I had a expert, intermediate to expert level class. It was taught online where I had them do some group work and some contests. And what I did was I said, Design a position sizing algorithm for a trading strategy 
and let's see who does the best out of all these groups. I divided them into, I think, six or seven groups. And I said, I'm going to give you three different strategies, and you design one, and then we're going to run that strategy in the position sizing method on unseen data, and we'll see what happens. Okay? So it was a pretty good test because that's what you'd be doing in the real world. You'd be looking at your existing results, applying a position sizing method, and then seeing how it runs in real time. Okay? The baseline would be to run one contract all the time. Just trade one contract continuously. And let's see if you can beat that. And we're going to use return to drawdown. So we're not using overall profit. We're going to use return to drawdown. So in other words, a risk adjusted return, which is a good way to evaluate these things because most people want to maximize their return for a given drawdown. So that's the criteria we're using. This was all the info I provided. Just some simple stats of the net profit, the number of trades a year. You know, I broke it up into long and short and gave you some standard deviations. So that's all the groups had to work with. And, you know, maybe you want to try it on your own. Well, this is what you would actually do. You'd use these kind of numbers, build your system but leave the last four or five years of results out, right? And then look at them. That's what we did here. And you'll see there were seven teams and here are their results compared to the yellow, which is the one contract all the time. So that's the number, the return to drawdown that they had to beat. And you can see there was only one case out of all those out of 21, there was only one that beat the baseline. There were a couple that tied because, in effect, what they were doing is just trading one contract. But there was only one case where they actually could beat the baseline. And that was just with one strategy. One strategy. The other two strategies, they couldn't beat it. So that should tell you it's pretty hard because we had some pretty high level people here. We had PhDs, we had doctors, we had engineers, we had accountants, we had some pretty high finance type people. That's as good as they could do. Okay? So again, the conclusion, position sizing is really difficult, especially when you put it on unseen data. It's easy when you apply it to data you know about because then you can just optimize for it. But every strategy acts a little different in real time. And when it does, that could thwart all your position sizing plans. So watch out for that. So can position sizing be a free lunch? And what I mean by that, can it give you returns without additional risk? Well, you can measure that through the MAR ratio, which is return to drawdown. And since you want it as high as possible, that's a good way to see if you get a free lunch. Again, going back to our sample strategies for the euro, depending on the amount of equity you have, you can see, starting with different amounts of equity, you don't really get too much difference in your return to drawdown uh, and the different methods some of them give different but a lot of them are around the same somewhere where you're one to one to two to one and that's about as good as you can get because you do get more return but you also get more drawdown and if you look at the gold strategy it's a little worse it's about one to one it's about the best you can get so this is interesting because regardless of the position sizing method, you, there's really almost no way to get infinite return to drawdown. You know, you're going to get more drawdown for more return, meaning this ratio doesn't change a whole lot. So the return to risk ratio, maybe it depends a little bit on starting equity because 
you could see it, those curves weren't, up, weren't flat. And different strategies are going to have different best position sizing methods. And the bottom line is there's really no free lunch here. If you want more reward, you're going to take on more risk. And the ratio of them doesn't really change that much. And that's why all those curves were basically more or less kind of flat with equity. You couldn't get unlimited rewards for a certain risk value. Now, there is a little caveat to all this. You can sort of get a free lunch depending on how you treat your equity in your account, okay? So what I've been talking about up to now is you treat your equity as if it's your money. What some people do is any winnings that they had, they'll be more aggressive with their winnings. And they'll look at their drawdown not based on your peak equity, but based on your initial equity that they started with. So, for example, for me, let's say you start with the $10,000 account, you go up to $50,000, and then you fall to $25,000. Your peak equity was 50, your last equity was 25, so that's a 50% drawdown in my mind. But now some people would say, well, really, I went from $10,000 to $25,000 at the end, that's what I'm interested in. I don't care that it went to 50000 and I lost half my money. So when you treat it like that, if you're one of those kind of people that treat house money as extra money, well, then you can get over 100% returns a year. And your drawdowns can only be 100%, right? So you can kind of trick things and trick your thinking into getting big returns but you don't get big drawdowns the thing is with this just look at it instead of percentage wise look at it as dollars and see if you feel the same way okay so that's position sizing and that's just individual systems maybe a way to look at this is to look at portfolios so i'm going to talk a little bit about portfolio analysis. Years ago, I decided to look at modern portfolio theory. I mean, this is a pretty well-known financial principle and area of study. Uh, Harry Markowitz invented it, and he won a Nobel Prize for it. It's pretty neat. What it means is if you look at return on the y-axis and volatility along the x-axis, it says there's a curve and your goal is to be at the top of the curve which means you get maximum return for a given amount of equity okay and a, a given amount of volatility I should say so you get a maximum you maximize your return for a given volatility level or you can think of that as a drawdown value so you want to maximize that return to drawdown Okay, you want to be on that upper curve. So, if you know the max return you want, you can then tailor your volatility to give you that. Okay, and it, it comes down to more or less a number crunching type thing. And that's what I did. I took all my strategies. I said, I'm going to trade all those strategies either with zero contracts, one contract, two, three, four, five, you know, all those combinations, which was billions of combinations. But I wanted to see which return and drawdown combination, uh, you know, the return to drawdown, with, how do I maximize it for a certain combination of contracts? I had 50 strategies, and that turned out to be 15.6 billion combinations. You know, you think of having strategy one with zero contracts and then all the other ones with one to five or zero to five. Then you have strategy one with one contract, all the other ones with zero to five. It's a lot of combinations. 
And if you pick the best one, isn't it just optimizing? Well, yeah, it is. And, and when you look at it that way, all the bad things about optimizing can still happen when you look at it on a portfolio level. So here's what I did. I said every month I'm going to look at all the combinations of contracts that I could be trading for these strategies. I'm going to pick the best one and trade that for the next month. And so I did this for a few months and looked at my performance. And, and guess what happened? Well, here I'll show you. Month one, I picked the point where I maximized. I said I wanted 20% volatility. Turned out it was a 20% return. Hey, I'm there. The bad thing was, at the end of the month, here's where I ended up with more volatility and less returns. So I said, oh, well, that wasn't the optimum anymore. So I'm going to try again. Second month, I was going for, I think, 19% volatility and 19% return. So I was at a different place. And this time, I actually ended up losing money during the month with more volatility. So the point was, what was on the optimum part of the curve one month wasn't the next month. It changed every month. And that's the bad part of it. I was never near the optimum. So I was always chasing the performance. You know, I'd always try to oh, balance it every month, and I was never coming close to it. And eventually I kind of gave up. So, you know, maybe I did some analysis wrong, or maybe I was just chasing a moving target. Probably a little bit of uh, both. I mean, I'm sure I wasn't exactly right with everything I was analyzing, but I know it definitely felt like I was chasing a moving target. And that was the problem. So, okay, so wrapping up, what have we kind of learned today? Well, first, reward and risk generally go together. So don't expect to get unlimited rewards unless you're willing to risk a lot. And based on just a simple example, there really is no best position sizing approach. There is no best portfolio approach. There's definitely different ways to do it. Some are good, some are bad, but don't think there's going to be a one size fits all for your strategies. And watch out. These are very easy areas to fall victim to optimization. You know, everybody pretty much realizes when you optimize a moving average length, that's not a good thing. But a lot of people might not realize that optimizing the number of contracts you're trading to maximize your portfolio return is a bad way to optimize too. So be careful with that. And finally, realize that even with those winning strategies that I showed you, because they have ups and downs, you can easily blow out your account if you're overly aggressive with your position sizing. So, for more information, if you're interested in this topic, uh, Van Tharp has a book, the, the Definitive Guide to Position Sizing. has a whole bunch of models you can try out. Brent Penfold, in his great book, The Universal Principles of Successful Trading, has a whole big chapter dedicated to position sizing. So, I encourage you to look at that. But remember, whatever you do, just don't optimize. And if you have questions, for me, please leave a comment. I'll answer all comments because if you have a question, probably other people do too. Or you can send me an email. There's my email address. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'm Kevin Davey. Thanks for watching.